Um, so welcome. This is Phenomena-Based Three-Dimensional Instruction, and my name is Rebecca Gorelli. I am the new K-12 Science and STEM Specialist here at the ADE. Okay, thanks to those who took a moment. Um, anytime I ask you to do something in the chat box, you'll see this little live chat icon pop up, and that's when you know it'll be your turn to say something. So let's get started. Thanks for being here. Okay, here's our goals. Um, we're going to start with the first one. Uh, all the webinars we do, we always start with, you know, just a basic understanding of the instructional shifts that are new to our new standards and how that relates to three-dimensional science instruction. We will only spend a little bit of time on this, but I always feel it's good practice to just review the new standards just to make sure everyone has foundational knowledge that's the same. So here we go. This is an amazing document called A New Vision for Science Education, and it really talks about the shifts needed to switch from our performance objectives into what we now are calling content standards. And so if you haven't seen this before, um, that's okay, I'm gonna blow it up here in a minute, hopefully you can read it. It's just really what will, on the left, what will science education involve less of and what will it involve more of? So what I'd like to do is just take a moment, maybe a minute or two and read over this document and then in the chat box, please, just think about what are three to five items that resonate with you. Yeah, definitely having students problem solve. Thank you. Student driven, absolutely. Yep, driven by students, thanks. Yeah, and so what I really love about this document is it really shows us the shift from really learning about science to trying to figure out science. And we see the word phenomena in here. If you look at the second point down, systems thinking and modeling to explain phenomena. We are really gonna talk about phenomena a lot going forward. And let's just keep in mind that our students are really the drivers of this instruction. So let's move on. And thanks to those who collaborated. Here's a fun word cloud that was actually generated with teachers at uh, Coolidge High School. And so what I love about this visual is it really shows you that shift of where performance objectives are here on the left, where we have this worksheets, textbooks, memorization of facts, just learning about vocabulary, rote memorization, teacher driven. And then that's kind of the side where we think about just learning about science. And when you look to the word cloud on the right, here comes the shift in instruction. This is when students are gonna start figuring things out instead of just learning about them. So in this type of instruction, we're engaged, we're doing investigations, open-ended modeling, explaining, exploring, arguing, providing evidence, and this is all driven by the students. So that was just a quick overview of the shifts. Next, we're gonna talk about the uh, new Arizona science standards and really dive a little bit into what are these three dimensions. And then after we have that conversation, we're gonna talk about how does phenomena really fit into these three dimensions. So here we go. I'm not sure who I have with me, so let's just do a temperature check. Um, how comfortable are you with the new science standards? And if you don't mind, just put a one, two, three, or four in the chat box that corresponds to how you're feeling. So if you're not really familiar with them, that's okay too. Yeah, all, all levels of comfort are totally welcome. And so while we're waiting for others to kind of think through their comfort level, take a look at this graphic on the right. The overarching theme that everything we do in science education going forward with the new standards is really anchored on this big umbrella idea of phenomena. And then underneath phenomena comes the three dimensions, which you can see are yellow, blue, and green. That's what we're gonna talk about next, but I just wanted to remind you that phenomena is the thing that ties all three dimensions together. So let's move on and talk about three-dimensional learning. So just a little background information. Our new Arizona Science Standards were developed using two separate research documents. Just like the Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS, Arizona did use the framework for K-12 science education to develop our standards. So in that category, or that research, we are very similar to the Next Generation Science Standards. However, what the Next Generation Science Standards does not use is this additional research document that we used. 
this is called working with big ideas of science. So the way we phrase how our standards were created is that we say we are a framework-based state, not an NGSS state. We use the framework just like NGSS to develop our standards. And from this framework comes the three dimensions. In chapter three in the framework is the first dimension, the science and engineering practices. In chapter four, the framework goes into a second dimension called the cross-cutting concept. And chapter five goes into the third dimension, which is the disciplinary core idea in physical, life, and space science. And so if we take a look at three-dimensional instruction, here are the actual three dimensions. The first one is the science and engineering practices. And this is really what describes behaviors that scientists engage in as they investigate and build models and theories about the natural world. They are also include the key set of engineering practices that engineers use as they design and build models and systems. The framework uses the term practices instead of a term like skills to emphasize that engaging in scientific investigation requires not only skill, but also knowledge that is specific to each practice. And there are eight of these. The second dimension is the cross-cutting concepts. These are taught within the context of instruction with the disciplinary core ideas and not by themselves in isolation. There are seven of these. And the third dimension is what we call the core ideas. These disciplinary core ideas have the power to focus K-12 science curriculum, instruction, and assessments on the most important aspects of science, which are the physical, the earth and space, life sciences, and using science and engineering in the everyday world. These core ideas are used to build a coherent progression of learning for our students from kindergarten through 12th grade. In the next slide, we're going to watch a short six-minute video that really explains the three dimensions in detail. And so, just so that we all have the same foundation of knowledge before we start diving into phenomena, and instead of having you read these chapters from the framework, there's a video that explains how three dimensions translates into classroom instruction. However, this video was created for the Next Generation Science Standards, but because we are also a framework-based state, just like NGSS, the information in the video can be applied to the new Arizona Science Standards that were written with the framework. If you hear NGSS in the video, please replace it in your mind with the Arizona Science Standards and think of these questions as you watch. When we learn things, it isn't for memorizing a piece of information. Just reciting science facts or principles is not what we want children to be able to do. We want them to be able to go out in the world and make sense of novel phenomena. So making sense of things really is engaging in a performance and saying, I need to construct an explanation of why or how this occurs. Okay, let's get started. Are you ready? 56. Throughout the two days, I want you to engage as the scientist, you as the student, you as the learner. If it was room temperature water, would it be behaving in the same way? What's the science behind this? What's happening? As teachers start focusing on the next generation science standards, they will be able to help students see science as it really is, that it's not just a set of steps and procedures. The real hope is that they can make a connection between what we do in the modeling of performances of science and what they do in their classroom. Oh, wow. In this day and age, one of the factors influencing the next generation science standards is the globalization, understanding we're in a global community. We're not kind of an isolated entity here. The Next Generation Science Standards takes the vision from the framework for K-12 science education and puts it into a set of performance expectations. And it calls for the students to actively engage in science. It sets out parameters for science education, clear goals, along with describing the three dimensions that students can engage in to make sense of science. Three dimensions are the cross-cutting concepts, 
the science and engineering practices and the disciplinary core ideas. Most of those ideas are not new. The integration of them, pulling those three dimensions together, is new. If we're going to have the kids doing that, instruction has to reflect that. What I'm walking away from today, kind of a big shift for me, is we can focus in on something very specific to help teach a much broader, bigger idea, that it actually helps the students be able to do that application to new scenarios, new situations. Cross-cutting concepts. There's seven of them. The way we've organized them is around causality, structure and function, systems, scale and proportion, change and stability, matter and energy, and then the last thing, patterns. These cross-cutting concepts are tools that you provide to the children, and they use those tools to make sense of phenomena. So we're looking for changes in the system. There's condensation on the outside. The cross-cutting concepts are a way of organizing the phenomena in terms of what the system is that's being studied. What did you define as your system? We included in our system also the surrounding air. The idea that there's a cause-effect relationship. What's causing the cloudiness? That's causing the bubbles to come off of the ice. Okay. It's going to get pushed in the direction of the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, patterns used as evidence to support their explanations. So to me, the pattern is just the fluttering back and forth, right? Do you have a question in mind? Why that pattern, that the back, back and, and forth. forth pattern? What yeah. if we change the direction of the flag if we turn it this way? Okay. I want to go inside and make a little paper flag that we can blow on and manipulate. The practices are a set of things that children do in engaging in science performances. Asking questions right here, that's what students do. As a professional teacher, you have to create an environment in which students are asking questions that help them make sense of things. Ready? 150. Why doesn't that ball return to that exact same level that you dropped it? Engaging students in the practices really does pique their curiosity, and it helps them have a desire to go out and have more questions about the world, which asking questions is a practice. So it's something we want them to be able to do and to be able to discover more about the world. What else contributes to it not reaching its maximum height that it started at? The pull of gravity. Gravity is still pulling it back down even though it's bouncing up. As learners, using evidence and using that evidence to construct explanations is important. I think having those experiences will really help students own the content. So more happening? bounce, yeah. more energy in the bounce, right. and that's really the kinetic energy. The last dimension of the core ideas, and there's nothing new here. We don't want kids at the end of instruction to recite the core ideas. We want them to use them in science performances to make sense of novel phenomena, applying them to construct exclamations and develop arguments. So the alcohol is less dense than the ice, as you can see. The density in there is different. Oh, yeah. The core ideas in particular become valuable because we revisit them through every grade band, and they're moving forward in a very logical way. Those things we're asking them to do can be applied to more than just alcohol and water. It can be applied to cloud formation. It can be applied to condensation. Why? What's happening? I think what's exciting about the Next Generation Science Standards is this intersection of the three dimensions and that we're not just working on practices one day. You really are infusing the three dimensions within the classroom. One of the things that you've done is asking what if. By doing that, I have to be able to take what I know, what I've learned, looking at the models, looking at patterns, and applying them somehow to show that I understand what would happen if I changed a dynamic. It's been real helpful to remember that, you know, I can't do one without thinking about the other. No change, we should add that, right? That's how students are going to be thinking about them as well. Oh, it's, it's cute. cute. It's my hope that this will be the reform in science education that not only gets students more proficient in science, but builds interest in science. Okay, welcome back. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a second, but while you're waiting, if you wouldn't mind uh, trying to answer at least one of those questions in the chat box from the video. Yes, thanks.
yeah, the 3D instruction definitely brings it together. Makes it real and the students will be applying their knowledge. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any thoughts? And if not, that's okay. Um, if you still have an idea you'd like to drop in the chat box, go ahead. We're just going to keep moving forward. Here's a document that I wanted to share with you just to review what happened in that video. And so this is called the Arizona, um, the AZSS Framework Snapshot. And basically this is a tool, um, if I were in the classroom, I would take out and really spend some time planning using this document. And so up here we have the first dimension, the science and engineering practices. This is what students are doing. This is how they access the content through these practices. The second dimension is the cross-cutting concepts, and this is the lens through which students think about phenomena. And the third dimension in Arizona actually is broken into two sections. On the left here in the yellow, we have the core ideas for knowing science, and what's very unique to just Arizona is we also have core ideas of using science. And so together, these three dimensions are what make up our new Arizona science standards. And so the yellow box is really the content, and the purple box is really how are the students using science. This is the application of science. This is where engineering comes in. This is that nature of science sort of practice. And so today for our discussion, we're going to spend some time talking about U1. If I'm on a standard and I'm, I'm sitting down to plan and I see a U1 pop up in my standard, this is the ticket to clue me in to say this is something you need to find a phenomena for. A phenomena is going to help them start to make sense of the science. If I see a U2 in the standard, the phenomena might not be an observable event that happens in the world, but it might be a problem related to engineering that requires a solution. So um, today we're really going to focus on U1 phenomena. So just a quick review of the coding and how to read the standards in case there are some folks who may not know. Here are two standards I pulled out for you just to go over the coding. The first letter or number indicates the grade level. So we have kindergarten and second grade. The second section, E1, U1, that designates the core idea for knowing, which is E1 or Earth Science Core Idea 1, and the core idea for using, which is U1. And again, if I see a U1, that is um, a clue that I need to be using some phenomena to help my students make sense of science, which we're going to talk about next. And the final piece, this is just an arbitrary number. This is kindergarten standard three on the top, and that is second grade standard number four. It is just an arbitrary number that helps you identify which standard you're talking about. So the top one is kindergarten number three, and the bottom is second grade number four. So if we put it all together, we should see the three dimensions within one of our standards. And I pulled out a fourth grade physical science standard here. And if you look at the coding, you can see, and uh, the way our standards are written, if you see the bolded print, develop and use a model, that is a clue that that is your doing science dimension or your science and engineering practice. Then, when we think about the cross-cutting concept, in Arizona, we actually are allowed to choose our cross-cutting con concept. And so for this one, if I read the standard, develop and use a model to demonstrate how a system transfers energy from one object to another, even when those objects are not touching, I automatically hear two different cross-cutting concepts in there. I hear energy and matter, or I could use system and system model. In Arizona, we have the opportunity to choose our own cross-cutting concept that we think fits best. And the core idea for learning or knowing is P4, which you can see in the coding. And then again, we have U1, which means I'm going to need to really think about phenomena that relates to this core idea. And so for our final goal, we are going to start talking about phenomena and how can I use these phenomena to drive standard-based instruction. So here we go. I'm curious to know uh, what is in your head. So where have you all heard of phenomena described, especially in relation to science teaching? So take a moment and drop some ideas in the chat. Think about how have you heard phenomena, especially in relation to science teaching? Okay, definitely an event or something that happens that you can explore. Absolutely. Science is based on phenomena, okay. Any other thoughts before we move on? 
If not, that's okay. You can still drop an idea in the chat box. Yeah, get some thinking about science. Thank you. All right, so here's our first example. I'd like you to take a look at this picture and think about what are some possible things we could try and figure out or explore in this picture and list as many as you can in the chat box. Yeah, definitely. So even from this simple picture, I could really sit down and think about many different phenomena that are, that's occurring in here. So thanks for participating. Let's keep moving. So how important is phenomena in our standards? Well, on page two of our introduction, here is the definition of phenomena. They are observable events that can be explained or explored. Science aims to explain the causes of these events or phenomena using scientific ideas, concepts, and practices, which is basically the three dimensions. So it is incredibly important. It is literally on the very first page of our standards, so I hope you read it. And the word phenomena or phenomena happens to appear 114 times in the framework. So it's incredibly important that we understand what it is and how do we use it with students. So let's get moving. So what exactly is a phenomena? Um, if you haven't seen Bozeman videos yet or know who Paul Anderson is, this is an excellent video that I, I recommend sharing with your colleagues. It's a little bit long, it's about eight minutes, but it's really gonna help us understand what is good phenomena and what do I do with the phenomena? So while we're sitting here, we're gonna watch this video, it's about eight minutes long, and just start thinking of the content you teach and you know how could phenomena fit in with what you already do? And I'll pull up the video in just a second. Hi, it's Paul Anderson. In this video, I'm gonna talk about scientific phenomena and sense making. It's basically what students are trying to figure out in class and how they're doing it. Remember, this video is in a set of larger videos on scientific inquiry. It's essentially the five steps of scientific inquiry and coming up with the right phenomena is that first step. Um, whenever I work with teachers on phenomena, it's important to define the word to begin with. Remember, phenomena is plural, but it essentially means any observable event in the natural world. So that could be a scientific demonstration, it could be a case study, it could be a data set, it could be watch watching plants and animals grow, it could be as beautiful as a double rainbow or as ugly as a concussion in humans. This is what students are figuring out in class and this is how they're building their understanding of science. Now you might say as a science teacher, well I already do all of those things and I think I did as well when I was teaching science but we probably do it out of order if you think about a typical unit we usually start with explanation and then we go to exploration so let me give you an example let's say I'm teaching biology and I'm teaching a unit on cell division I might have my students read first there could then be lecture maybe a video I use a worksheet maybe I show them how to use a microscope and we look at cells that are going through division all of this is me explaining the science at the beginning and at the end there might be a lab maybe there's an exploration phase where they look at onion root mitosis and they look at how many cells are in each different phase and come up with a graph of that and so the exploration is left to the end. And so if we look at this unit, there's really good phenomena in here. There's gonna be the phenomena of the onion roots and it, every kid loves looking at cells and especially looking at cells as they start to divide. And so the idea of using phenomena and sense making is that we shift the exploration to the beginning. We start with those really interesting phenomena and we put that student at the center of trying to understand how they work. Now scientific inquiry is the way that students go through this process of sense making, trying to understand what's going on with that cells, how they divide and how they change over time. Now we're also gonna have all these other parts of good teaching. We're gonna have lecture, we're gonna have reading, and at the end you have to stand up there as a teacher and really kind of pull together all of the knowledge, but that understanding should come from the students themselves. And so when you're starting to plan units, those days of just opening up the book and let's start with chapter three, or looking at the standards and saying like, what do I have to teach? Oh, I know how to teach that. And I, as teacher guiding it, are probably gone. We're moving towards this new area of what's called storylining where you put phenomena at the center of a storyline. What's a storyline? It's just like a good book. It has a start, it has a finish, and then there has to be some conflict that runs throughout that whole book that kind of is driving your interest. And that's what those phenomena are gonna be. That one phenomena that drives that whole storyline is now referred to as an anchoring phenomena. 
It's the one thing that students are going to be building knowledge on each day and contributing to a better understanding. Now we're going to have other phenomena in the unit itself. We're going to have what are called supporting phenomena. Sometimes we call those investigating phenomena. Some of those phenomena will probably come from students' own investigations. And that's how we build that understanding. So let's say I'm teaching this unit on cell division. Maybe we start with this overarching anchoring phenomena of the glow fish. Kids are always interested in that. It's a genetically modified fish that glows. Maybe the unit is called, how did the glow fish get its glow? And every day we're gonna build a better understanding of that. I'm pretty sure these fish are patented, but you can grow zebra fish just regularly in the class. And so the kids could actually be doing scientific investigations on those embryos. Now we'd also use other supporting phenomena. The one things that we've always used in a, in a good unit on cell division. And as students move through this, they're using those science and engineering practices to make sense or build knowledge of that and thereby starting to understand like the science that we want them to understand. Now this is just an example. Let me give you some real examples. I was working with some elementary teachers at the American School of Dubai. They have a really good garden program. One of the students had been stung by a bee and they had poisoned the bees on campus, the grounds people. So that became their anchoring phenomena. This is the garden supervisor. And what she's doing is having to self-pollinate each of those flowers. And so that becomes the anchoring phenomena there for their unit. Why do we need the bees? And the kids are investigating that. I think they now have a whole colony of bees on campus there. Or you could look at the next gen storylines. They built some wonderful storylines around phenomena and evolution one is why antibiotics don't work like they used to. And this is one that is really engaging to students because it ties together evolution, something that they can see right now and that idea of, uh, that they could be in peril. And so it's a really good way to drive instruction. Now, what makes a good phenomena? The first thing that makes a good phenomena is it should spark curiosity and it should spark wonder. So here's an example of a phenomena that I use in class. If you write on a glazed plate with just a regular dry erase marker, you let it dry a little bit, and then you pour some water on it, the letters are going to start to float up. First time kids see this, they're like, wow, that's amazing. Why is that occurring? Once they start to say that, you know that you have them. Once you show them something, they want to understand what's going on. Now you've got a pretty good phenomena. It's important, however, that your phenomena that you choose addresses a standard. I could spend weeks on this as the kids investigate different parts of it, but if it's not tied to a specific phenomenon, I'm wasting the student's time. In this case, it's tied to this uh, physical science standard on intermolecular forces and bulk structure, so I'm good to go. You also want to make sure that it can be investigated. What's great about this phenomenon is the kids could do their own experiments in class and kind of test those ideas of what they think is causing this behavior. Now, you also want to know that all phenomena don't have to be phenomenal. <laughs> now, what does that mean? If kids can investigate and we put them in the position of a scientist, they're going to engage. So I was planning a, a uh, lesson with a teacher, and it was just essentially on Punnett squares. And we wanted to figure out what's the phenomena going to be, and we just gave them the data from Gregor Mendel. We just gave the data that he had and put them in the position of a scientist, and they totally engaged. I've done this with the finches of the Galapagos as well. Just give them the data, put them in the position of the scientist, and they're going to have fun. Okay, so hopefully you got some really good information from that video. Um, and sorry, so I'll move this. And let's get going. So just um, a reminder about the definition that is in our standards is that a phenomena is an observable event. And the goal of using this is to help students with sense making in science. And so what does this actually look like in the classroom is kind of where we're going next. So when I sit down to introduce a phenomena, I obviously need to start by looking at my standards. And by looking at my standards, I need to understand the core idea and the content that's behind that standard. And once I've done that, I can find a short video or a, a piece of data to present or lead a demonstration or an exploration. This is what's called a stimulus, okay? It's just a, a brief exploration of something or phenomena, and you can even bring it into the classroom. So here's some examples. There's some videos, some pictures. We have floating M&Ms, the pink lake, or the bear that lost its head. Then, once you find a video that corresponds to the content in your standard, you show it to the students and get their ideas about the questions they have about that phenomena. So we show it to them, and this is called the launch, and then we start to generate questions, which is one of our science and engineering practice. So we're gonna try this out. Um, 
We're going to watch this really short video clip of the tanker car imploding. And then, after you watch it, I want you to think about what science content, what did the students need to know in order to explain this video. And when you're ready, go ahead and drop some thoughts in the chat box about the content. So here we go. Okay, I'll show it one more time. And that's it. So just take a minute and think about what content do the students need to know in order to explain that phenomena. Okay, maybe something about density, pressure, temperature, density. Okay. And so as the teacher, I really need to think about what is really beneath this phenomena and is it something accessible to my students and can, it ex can they explore it? And so what does this look like from the student side of things? So if I were in the classroom and I showed them this stimulus or I launched um, you know, at the beginning of my lesson with this phenomena, I would ask the students to make a T-chart in their notebook and just say, what do you notice on one side and what do you wonder? That I wonder really starts to help students generate questions. And so if the students start to, to, to worry about this at all, you can always say, what are some related things we know or have experienced that could help us understand what's going on here and help them elicit those initial ideas and connect to prior experiences? So what could be one I wonder question you have that you can share in the chat box? Ah, something about the hose. Excellent, thanks for sharing. Anyone else have any I wonder questions about this phenomena? What are the contents of the container? Thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay, if you still have ideas, go ahead and drop them in the chat box. We're just going to keep moving. So let's think about this. We showed the phenomena, we launched it with a stimulus. Then we start to ask the students, you know, what do you see and what do you wonder? And this starts generating those questions. And then if we were going to continue with this activity, students might draw an initial model of what they think is happening by themselves. Too often we ask students to, you know, turn and talk to a partner, but they haven't had any think time on their own. So what we want to do is actually have an individual brainstorm. And this is actually a teacher who used this uh, tanker car in her classroom with high school students. This is a video I pulled off of Ambitious Science Teaching, uh, has awesome video gallery of, you know, three-dimensional science instruction. And what she asked them to do is to think about you know, what was happening inside of the tanker and outside and what made it crush and why and how. And she guided them to start thinking about, you know, before and after and draw a diagram. That's what we call an initial model. And that's another science and engineering practice. So, so far, we've engaged in asking questions and developing and using a model to explain something. So once they've done the individual brainstorm, what they do then, let's say they're sitting in a group of four, is every student has already committed to their thinking by initially do, eliciting their ideas on their own document, on their own model. Then they get together and combine their ideas with the other members of the group to make what's called a group or consensus model. So they basically combine all of their ideas into one, and then she gave them some criteria, you know, make sure your drawings include molecules to show inside and outside. And you can see she also gave them some roles to fill in. And so what happened is the students sat down and they begin to put all of their ideas on one paper together for a consensus model and they will start to make those ideas public. And usually we do a gallery walk and we talk about, you know, what's the same in our models, what's different, should we have a common language about our models, and move the class forward in their thinking. But what's also great about doing these consensus models is now we've combined our ideas and now we can also start to ask even more questions. And so if we were to continue this activity, they might ask any remaining questions that they have. You might ask them to go back and say, okay, after you've done this model with your group, do you still have questions? And if so, add them to your I wonder chart. Then from that I wonder chart, pick the two top questions we think we need to know in order to figure out the phenomena and put them on post-its. So they might have a real long list of questions, but really asking them to categorize them and prioritize them and to think about what could we actually investigate next? What is something we need to figure out in order to make our model even better? 
So what we do is we design something called a driving question board, which is making a public record of all the questions. So we've narrowed our questions down to two, and then we start to group the questions in maybe these questions go with pressure, maybe this group has to go with temperature, maybe this group is really thinking about the weather outside, maybe another group is thinking about, um, I don't know, the contents inside. And so we start to group the questions, and eventually once you've gotten some groups, you put them up and you make them public, and as you begin diving in and investigating different parts, you leave your questions up, and as you learn, you start to figure out those questions. And it really is just kind of a project-based sort of thinking of what do we need to know and figure out. And then you decide collectively, what are we going to investigate next? Maybe we're going to put um, this lady actually in her class, she had them get out cans and try to remake what happened in the tanker car by doing an investigation with hot and cold water and ice cubes. So let's just debrief the launch. So how do we launch this with students? What, once we've talked, you know, we thought about our standard, we looked at phenomena, we set up the expectation that the students are going to observe something and it's going to need to be investigated. After that, we ask them to ask questions. It, the launch involves asking questions and puts the students in the driver's seat for the next series of lessons. Then the launch also engages the learner's prior knowledge and related experiences. When I ask you to think about when have you seen this before, when have you seen something similar to the tanker card, that's me trying to relate a different experience you've had. And finally, the launch requires the students to prioritize when to take up certain questions and provides a possible learning path for them to pursue. So I want you to think, how is this approach to engaging students different than what typically happens in science classrooms in your grade band? And how is this different from how you've learned? Take a moment to just reflect on that and write your ideas in the chat box. Yeah, definitely. The students are the ones driving it. And I'm often asked, you know, if students are the ones driving the path forward, you know, doesn't the teacher have to be prepared? Well, yes, we're going to kind of guide them to where we want them to go, just like we always do. And so let's keep going. Let's talk about why we use this process in order to engage students. This is a process that promotes sense making. Instead of learning about something, we are setting them up to learn how to figure things out instead. And so let's talk about where we started. We started with a phenomena that was based on a standard. Um, and so we think about what's an event in the world that happened that we need to explain. And we started with the tinker car. After that, we started to question, and this is where we get in our science and engineering practices a little bit. We go, huh, what happened? Okay, so we elicit our initial ideas first. We commit to our own thinking. Then after we have questions, we start to think of the practices. How are we going to model and start to explain this phenomena? And that's when you ask students to engage in what's called developing and using models. And naturally, they're going to start to explain things. And it's making their thinking visible on paper. And after that, when we're done with something like this, we start to go, huh, what have we figured out using this, these practices of asking questions and modeling? Are there any core ideas or cross-cutting concepts we figured out? And do we have any more questions? And that's where a driving question board comes into play, is we've figured out a few things by building consensus models, but we still have more questions, and where should we go next in order to make this model even better? And so here is what we call a storyline. It's a, showing the central role of phenomena. And if you haven't seen anything like this, it's a little bit different than, um, I guess, what's been happening in traditional classrooms. And so it starts with an anchor phenomena. The anchor phenomena is what I just showed you, a stimulus to launch a sequence of learning. So here we have the anchoring phenomena, which then turns into a driving question. You know, basically, how did this tanker car implode? And then we begin to have little lesson phenomena. So what we could do next for the tanker car is build and design an investigation to help us think about temperature or pressure or whatever those smaller questions were that we want to figure out. So then we have questions that we investigate, and then we came up with the initial model. And from the initial model, we asked questions again. 
and we start to have what is called investigative phenomena. So we have this larger overarching anchor phenomena that kind of secures a whole unit of learning. But then day to day to day to day, we have what's called lesson level phenomena or things we're going to investigate to help us figure out the anchor phenomena. And so this is kind of an iterative process where we're revising and adding to our model and coming back and coming back and investigating from questions we have. This is really different from just looking at performance objectives as one and done things to teach our students. And so how do you select phenomena? How are you going to know that the stimulus you have chosen, whether it's a video or a picture or a graph, how are you going to know it's the right fit? Well, from the video um, Paul Anderson talked about, identifying phenomena students could encounter in the real world. Have data, you can have data and supportive information. It's a plus, but you don't have to because you can figure that stuff out with the students. All three dimensions should be necessary to explain that phenomena. Phenomena can be, but they do not have to be phenomenal. And for example, here's what I mean. We could take something really amazing, like casting a shadow on the sun. But am I actually going to be able to get out there and show my students this? No. Could I pick something more simple with the same idea, like a light post casting a shadow on the ground, or a flower doing the exact same thing? So the point is phenomena, phenomena can be phenomenal, but they don't have to be. And so how are we going to know when we found a good candidate phenomena? Well, does it spark curiosity and wonder? It doesn't always have to be wow, but more of a huh? Get the kids start starting to think about and how to figure this out. It needs to be able to be investigated in more of a long process and is not just a, a closed sort of question with a yes or no answer. And it needs to address your standard, obviously. So let's go over a couple examples. Oh, I forgot we're going to talk about do not select a phenomena if it's peripheral to the subject content. If it does not surprise or generate very little curiosity, and the teacher has to do all the work, because remember, the students are in the driver's seat now. Involves science concepts that are way over their heads, too difficult or too complex. And if it's too complex and they just simply think of it as magic because they won't be able to figure it out, then those are probably phenomena we want to avoid. And so, how do we do this? Uh, I created this one pager that I borrowed from NSTA of really how do you walk through the process of designing phenomena based instruction. Well, the first thing you do is you start with your standard and I picked a fourth grade physical science standard. Develop and use a model to demonstrate how a system transfers energy from one object to another even when they're not touching. Then I start after I find the standard, I dig into the core ideas of knowing and using. So here we have P4, which is demonstrating how a system, right, it goes into the content I need to know, and the using science, which is U1, which clues me in that I need to engage my students with some phenomena and do some sense making with them. And so once I've kind of read my standard, I read the background information provided in the standards document, I can go back to the framework, I can read working with big ideas, I can do all of that and I feel confident in this content, then I can pick a phenomena. And here's one I picked. And then it plays it backwards. So once I read the content, my brain went right to magnets. And I said, okay, I'm going to use a phenomena about magnetism. Then I think of, okay, how am I going to get my students to actually engage and access this content? Well, that science and engineering practice comes next, and luckily it's called out for us in our standard. The SEP I'm supposed to use is develop and use a model. So right then I can think about, let's start getting our kids to ask questions and develop an initial model by drawing what they think is happening in this phenomena. Then I think about the cross-cutting concept, which is what is the lens through which these students can think about the phenomena? And in our standards document, which I took a screenshot, you can see that we have all seven cross-cutting concepts listed. Some of them are bolded on purpose. 
those are ones that the committee who wrote the standards are suggesting you might want to use, but it's not a mandate. You can choose whatever you think will fit best. So for this one, I went back and I read the standard and I see the word system. I also see the word energy. And so I can think through the lens of energy and matter and how energy cycles through, or I can think of the whole thing as a system and how is energy really coming through that system, inputs and outputs. And so it's up to us to figure out which cross-cutting concept we want to use. So here's one more example. I grabbed a third grade life science standard. I look, I find the core ideas of knowing, L2, U1. I read the standard, organisms that are interdependent. U1 means I'm going to have to pick a phenomenon, some sense making. It's not an engineering one. It doesn't have to do with human impact like U3 does. Then I start to think about, okay, what phenomena do I already know exists in the world having organisms that are inter interdependent? And so I came up with um, this uh, amazing phenomena where these little tiny frogs actually ride the back of this animal in Turkey um, when they wade through water. Or I've heard of the uh, wolves that were introduced into Yellowstone as being an amazing phenomena that showed how, you know, once they reintroduced wolves, the entire ecosystem started to thrive again. Or I can think of an aardvark or an anteater that, um, you know, is dependent on the 35,000 ants that it eats a day. So there's really many different phenomena. It's just where do you want your students to go and what do you want them to make sense of? So then, after I've de decided on a phenomena, I think about the science and engineering practice. It's called out for me in bold, which is construct an argument from evidence. Then I think of the cross-cutting concept. And again, in Arizona, we have the choice. For the anteater, I can think of structure and function because the structure and function of his long uh, snout is quite amazing. And I could think through that lens of the phenomena. Or I can think of systems and system models and how when we reintroduce these wolves in Yellowstone, how the entire system had, you know, different feedbacks happening. And so those are just some examples of how you think through, you know, picking phenomena. If you're looking for phenomena resources, there's tons of websites. Here are just a few of my favorites that I like to go to. And I will provide this for you in a resource document um, when I send you a follow-up email. And so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions going forward. My name is Rebecca Gorelli, and I'm the K-12 Science and STEM Specialist here at the agency. So I hope you learned something useful. Keep an eye out for those emails. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here.